Ramadan Mubarak to our Muslim colleagues and hello from Montreal. I am Kirsten Johnson, the incoming president for the Canadian Association of Emergency Medicine uh, Physicians, sorry, and this is our Cape COVID Town Hall, so welcome. So I am back uh, from Pavernatuk and I'm excited to host this week's Town Hall. A big thank you to Trevor Jane for hosting last week's session with Kirsten DeWitt and Bonnie Henry. I heard it was a great success. And the reason I was unable to host that uh, last week was that I was working up in Pavernatuk, Nunavik. So I made a short video that was supposed to air last week, but the internet bandwidth is too slow to send anything, so it had to wait till now. So Jeff, cue the clip. Hi everyone, it's Kirsten Johnson, and this week I am working in Pavernatuk, which is a little village of just under 2,000 people on the Hudson Bay coast of Nunavik, only accessible by air. For those of you who are not familiar with this part of the world, Nunavik comprises 18, mostly Inuit villages, along the Hudson Bay and Angava Bay coasts only accessible by air or boat. Villages range in size from 150 to 2,500 people and for the most part are above the tree line. Traditional ways of life are still adhered to, hunting and gathering, clothes made from seal skins and other fur, mukluks are painstakingly sewn by hand, babies are carried on mum's back, and sled dog teams are used for transport. Each village has a nursing station and the two main referral hospitals are in Pavernatuk and Kujuak. There are 16 cases of COVID in Nunavik, 14 of which are in Pavernatuk. Despite having a small team up here, they've completely transformed the hospital facility. There are testing tents outside and signs advising patients on infection precautions. The front entrance is manned by a triage team and security. The waiting room has a makeshift fishbowl and all of the elders have been moved off site. There are sufficient scrubs and PPE for all staff. The one small operating room is now a place to manage COVID patients in respiratory distress, keeping in mind that there are no RTs up here, so the doc has to do it all from setting up the equipment to hooking up the vent, and so organization is key. There are new walls that were literally put up overnight to divide the hospital in half, creating a hot zone for admitted COVID patients. I must say, I'm impressed with what they have done in a short amount of time in a resource-limited setting. So instead of joining you, this is my report from the field. Enjoy the town hall, everyone, and I'll see you next week. So that was my week last week, and now I am here in Montreal. And this week, we are in for another treat. We have doctors Ken Milne and Sean Moore, who will be providing us with a review of the literature on COVID-related therapeutics. Dr. Morgan Vibe will be talking about medication shortages and alternatives. And finally, Drs. Lim and Jane will have a discussion about wellness and the marathon we are in to stay well while, treated COVID, while treating COVID patients and managing all the stress to do with PPE and the upheaval to our practice and our daily routines. So Dr. Moore is a Chief of Emergency Services at Lake of the Woods Hospital in Kenora. He's the Associate Medical Director at Critical and Associate Medical Director at Orange Transport. He's an assistant professor at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and spends most of his academic time mentoring paramedics and physicians working in rural and remote emergency medicine. He is ready for the pandemic to end as the number of kids in his family is beyond the acceptable limit for gatherings in Ontario. Dr. Milne is the chief of staff at South Huron Hospital Association in Exeter, Ontario. He's been doing medical research for over 35 years and he's been working clinically for over 25. He's an adjunct professor in the Department of Medicine's Division of Emergency Medicine and the Department of Family Medicine at Western Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. He teaches evidence-based medicine, clinical epidemiology, critical appraisal and biostatistics at Western University in London, Ontario. Dr. Milne is passionate about skepticism and critical thinking. He is the creator of the Knowledge Translation Project, the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. And get this, Ken is married to Barb, and he has three amazing children. So of course, Barbie and Ken, and they of course will have three amazing children and probably a camper van to take them camping in. All right, so without further uh, delay, I'll let uh, Barb, no, sorry, Ken and uh, Sean get on with the show. <laughs> Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, so uh, I'm, I guess I'm uh, working with Bat Doc today, which makes me the Robin of the of the room for this time. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now, so you don't have to look at my mug. Uh, here we go. There we are. So welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the skeptical uh, analysis of treatments for COVID nineteen. Um, and I'm going to jump right in and uh, go to our 
disclosures, I have no grants or speakers, uh, bureaus or consulting fees, no big pharma, no medical devices, etc. And uh, you heard where I work at this time. And so for my disclosures, it's my biggest disclosure has to be, I love CAPE. I mean, who doesn't want to be a CAPE member? CAPE is fantastic. But I take no grants or consulting fees. I don't receive any funding from pharma or medical device companies, although I am on a faculty for a couple of education companies. I do some medical mal, and I have a patent on a pediatric resuscitation device. I would also like to uh, start by acknowledging that uh, we're on the traditional lands here in Kenora of Treaty Three Nations and Ken on the Upper Canada Treaty Nations where he is speaking and across Canada uh, as well. So these are truly COVID times and we're getting a tsunami of information. 400 million tweets about COVID have been shared in the last three months. Zoom meetings are now 24 seven like ours right now. And uh, emails um, that seem to change our terrible PPE protocols occur at a rate that is undeniably too much. Um, sometimes several times in a shift, uh, we'll change the protocols of by which we're going to be uh, caring for patients with, uh, with COVID. So, Ken, take it away. Well, you know how I always like to start about one of my passions, and that's evidence-based medicine. And if we're going to be talking about evidence-based medicine, I want to clear a few things up to start with. And so I've got a definition for evidence-based medicine, and this definition comes from Dr. Sackett. And of course, Sean Moore will advance the slide for me, and I'm buying him time to do that. Thank you. And so uh, evidence-based medicine, as defined by Dr. Sackett, was the conscientious, explicit, judicious use of the best evidence in making shared decisions. Now, I added that yellow part, the shared decision, about making the care of individual patients. And that's a little wordy, so I have a nice Venn diagram to try to explain what I mean when I'm going to be talking about the evidence and practicing evidence-based medicine. And so here's the Venn diagram. Now, a mistake a lot of us make is that we think evidence-based medicine is always about the literature. Oh, you have to have a randomized control trial on that. You have to have some kind of paper, some kind of study to really guide your care. But that's the key word. It's supposed to guide your care. And it's only one pillar of evidence-based medicine. The other two pillars up in the top right, you can see the clinician. And she needs to use her good clinical judge and reflect on our own practice when applying the literature. And then finally, of course, the third pillar is that we've got to remember to engage the patient. It's about their preferences and their values. And where those three things overlap, you've got the you literature. Like oh, no, nope, you've got the literature, you've got your clinical judgment, and then you've got the engagement with the patient. And then you have evidence-based medicine. It's not just about the literature. So, uh, but <laughs> you mentioned it, there is a tsunami. There are millions of tweets going on about COVID-19 right now. I mean, my Facebook feed, my Twitter feed is filled with virologists, epidemiologists, and public health experts who obtained their degree through Google in the last two months. And, you know, talking to all of these people online can be quite a challenge because there's so much noise and we've got to be able to tease out that signal. And I found this uh, wonderful video from this doctor. He's a physician in the UK and he made this video about the Dunning-Kruger effect. And for those people who are not familiar with Dunning-Kruger, they uh, have put out some papers in the last 20 years, but their first paper was back in 1999, talking about the cognitive bias of, if you have a little bit of knowledge, you seem to have a lot of confidence. And that little knowledge and a lot of confidence doesn't get you very far. What you really need is more information and a little bit more um, circumspect with regards to how sure you are of your opinion. So he made this ad and I wanted to show it to you guys. If you're like me, you know more about managing critically ill patients than doctors and scientists who dedicated their entire careers to it. And so you should drink Dunning-Kruger. It's the only choice for the self-educated gentleman. 
Dunning-Kruger. It'll give you confidence. Although I don't think you need any help with that. Cheers. All right. So that's setting the stage. Now let's take a little bit of time. Just talk about critical appraisal. And of course, Sean, how many steps did I have for critical appraisal? Five. Five, my favorite number because I can count to it on one hand. Yes, five steps to critical appraisal. The first thing is you've got to formulate your question. And using a PICO format is really helpful. So what patients are you worried about? Well, I'm worried about COVID patients. What's the intervention? What's the treatment? Are we talking about a med? Are we talking about proning people? Are we talking about aerosolizing procedure? But what's the intervention? What do we compare it to? And then what was the outcome? And we're really looking for a patient-oriented outcome or what's abbreviated as a poo. We don't want to do, that's a disease-oriented outcome. We don't want to sue, that's a surrogate-oriented outcome. We don't want to loo, that's a lab-oriented outcome. And I'm trying to coin this new term, a moo, because Sean and I are both rural physicians, and that's a monitor-oriented outcome. Oh, look, their map is above 65. Moo. The second step is you got to do a search. You got to search around and you got to search around for that evidence. And a couple of key places to go search. I mean, you can do a Google search, but really you can refine your search using something called Trip Database. And Trip Database is a great way, a great search engine to try to find the evidence you want to um, answer your question. The third step is that there is this hierarchy to find the least biased evidence. And what I mean when I say bias is something that systematically moves us away from the truth. It's not about random noise. So the least bias. Now, this is a bit of a hierarchy, this pyramid. And it starts down with observations, which are hypothesis generating or some case reports or some anecdotes, expert opinion. And then it goes up to randomized control trials. And at the top of this pyramid is a systematic review and meta-analysis, although there's some nuance to that. The fourth step is checklist, okay? So how do you get good at checklists? Practice, 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 right? Practice, practice, practice. And there are some checklists available from the Best Evidence Emergency Medicine Group, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, and I've got some checklists on my website. And then the fifth and final step is once you've got your question, done your search, look for the least biased evidence, ran through a checklist, then you sit back and reflect and say, hmm, will this change my practice? And that's what we're going to go through with some evidence. Sean, what do you got? So clinicians and researchers have been throwing things at the wall and seeing what's going to stick for some time. Everything that we can think of, including azithromycin, steroids, famotidine, IL-6 inhibitors, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir. Uh, I'm just going to stop you there, Sean. Sean, I got to stop you there. Could you give us the list of what hasn't been tried? Because we've only got so much time to do this. I don't think there's anything on the list. I don't think so. I think people are just throwing the kitchen sink at this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the shorter list really would be trying things, trying to find something that hasn't been tried. <laughs> and Ken is going to talk, go through some, uh, the big three in terms of what are some key points about critical appraisal. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there are lots of things we could have gone through, but I think there's some key ones that we need to go through. And so the first one is chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. And as people know, it's used to treat malaria, but it's also used for lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and it's effective in vitro against SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. It works in the Petri dish. Now, we do know that it can have serious cardiac side effects like QT prolongation and arrhythmias. But when we're thinking about a treatment, we've got to think about the potential benefits and the potential harms. So we know that it's effective in vitro, but Sean, you know what else is effective in vitro? Uh, maybe some alcohol greater than 60%. Uh, a little bit of uh, dish soap, right? Can break down the lipid layer in vitro. Drink UV lights. What's that? A drink of bleach. Some well, UV hey, listen, well. listen, we do not, we do not, Sean, we do not advocate that anybody inject or consume household disinfectants or cleaning products or use UV lights in places that are dark, um, even if they think it's a good idea. Um, but any, you know, a lot of different things work in vitro. Um, but what we need to do is, does it work in vivo in people? And so 
the first study that really captured everybody's attention was from a French author. And he published this study in April, April 11th of 2020. And it was published and it was after a bunch of other observational studies because there are a large number of observational studies. But observational studies can have bias. You can't conclude causation. It can be hypothesis generating. It can be interesting. But we really can't assign causation if it's an observational study. And so this small, and what I mean by small is 80 patients who had mild disease. And we're practicing in Canada. When I looked at the level of disease that these COVID patients had that were included in this cohort, we probably would have said, go home and self-isolate as opposed to admit to a hospital. But he looked at using hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. So I'm going to sneak that one in there too. In 80 patients, and they had to have follow-up within at least six days. And what he found was that it worked, or so he thought, because there was no comparison group. And that's the Achilles heel to this. They didn't grab a, another cohort and propensity score match. They just said, hey, we gave it to a bunch of people with mild disease, and they all did well. What do you think about that, Sean? Do you think most people with mild disease do well? <laughs> I think he's really putting up a straw man comparison in this. It is, yeah. You know, so um, now one during the time of publication died and one person was still in the ICU, but it really didn't provide us really a great deal of information. And so some people just jumped on the bandwagon and said, hydroxychloroquine for all. Now we do have a randomized control trial, and this was by Dr. Tang, and he works in Shanghai, China, and he looked at hydroxychloroquine and he published this three days after the other study, but it was a randomized control trial. Now it was open label, so people would know what they were getting. So there'd be some bias involved with that, with the lack of blinding, but at least it was randomized and they had a control group. It was about twice the size with 150 patients in it. And what they found was little to no benefit and no surprise, more adverse events. Now, not more serious adverse events, but this study was powered to find efficacy of benefit. It wasn't powered to find harm. So they didn't really find much benefit and they found more adverse events. And in COVID times, things move fast. May 2nd, Academic Emergency Medicine came out with a systematic review on this. This was a rapid report put out by Chaudhry et al., looking at chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine as a treatment for COVID-19. And it found seven studies to be included into this systematic review. Five looked like they had favorable outcomes and two showed no benefit. But when you looked at the individual studies, because this is the problem with systematic reviews, it's sort of like garbage in, garbage out, right? It has to be the quality of the study that's included. And all had high or some risk of bias. None of the studies were of low risk of bias. So they concluded that there's not enough evidence to support the routine use of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine for this. And so when Sean and I were looking at it, we came up with this conclusion. When we put our skeptical eye upon this, is that we cannot recommend hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine based on the current evidence. And the time to accept a claim is when there is sufficient evidence. Now, randomized control trials don't give us the, and I'm going to use air quotes here, truth, but rather the best point estimate of effect size. And science is iterative. And as new information is reported, it should be considered with the existing evidence. Most of my positions are tentative and subject to change. And as a skeptic, if they publish, if, you know, tomorrow, if I open up the journal or my news feed or something like that, and there's a published study with high quality that shows efficacy of a patient-oriented outcome, oh yeah, I'll change my mind. I'll incorporate it into my practice. But that's our review on that first big class of drugs, the anti-malarial drugs that came out to address COVID-19. So I'm going to jump in and speak briefly about uh, the effect of steroids and the utility of steroids in, in SARS-CoV-2. Um, this is one, I, I start this slide off on purpose, and uh, Ken, maybe you can give us the, uh, the, 
the uh, special effects in the science. Oh, yes. Um, before the uh, meeting, uh, Cape said, I asked them, you know, what's our budget for this? And they gave me a nice round number. <laughs> and so here are the special effects. Woo! Look at these graphics. Look at this. And this is what people do when they want to explain the pathophysiology of why something should work. And what yeah. we need is to demonstrate that it does work. So the basic premise of using steroids in COVID-19 is that inflammation tends to be central to the pathophysiology. People get a inflammatory, terrible inflammatory response phase in this. Um, and in US patients and others, People tend to, with ARDS, use pressors if, if individuals don't, refer, don't actually respond to pressors and other, uh, other efforts to maintain normal blood pressures in the, in the setting of septic shock. Uh, in obstetrics, we use, uh, we use various uh, steroids with fetal lung maturation and other issues, and we use it in, uh, in patients who have COPD, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you look a little bit more closely, oops. Um, I think I may have, there we go, um, at some of the, uh, the studies that have come out. And uh, these are, again, small numbers. These are not powered for a lot of, um, you know, it's, you know a, a lot of information when we actually look at whether or not steroids are going to be helpful. It looked like there might be some decreased risk of death in numbers like 84 and in numbers like 26. So there's some initial information that may actually make people want to use them. If you look a little bit more closely at this, it does not appear that those things are robust enough to have a real effect. And so much so that, that we have information from a number of working groups, including um, the American Thoracic Society, who said they came close to making a weak recommendation against not using, against using it. And in um, uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine, they said, well, we can make a weak recommendation that maybe it can be used in COVID if there's ARDS. And the WHO said, well, you know what? You can use it if they've got COPD or asthma or they're pregnant and they need fetal lung maturation, whatever the indication, if they've got another reason. So the bottom line for steroids is don't use them outside of a randomized control trial at this time. There is some information and some risk associated with using steroids that may um, it may outweigh the, uh, the benefit of, of potentially causing any positive effect. But if there's another reason for using them, don't stop using them. Go ahead. And I'm going to jump in there and say, anytime Sean says may, I can say may not. Right, Sean? Exactly. It's just and equally as accurate. really well in every single slide. It may <laughs> or may not. Or it may not. Um, now, now we have a glimmer of hope. Now there is a sun rising on the horizon. Remdesivir. Ooh. So this is the latest story in this COVID-19 um, pandemic. And what happened with uh, remdesivir is they started looking for what could they use against this RNA virus. And remdesivir has been uh, developed to treat Ebola and it inhibits RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which is about 96% identical actually between MERS SARS and COVID-19. And it's actually demonstrated activity in vitro. Again, a lot of things can work in the Petri dish, but also there is some evidence in vivo in animal models in MERS and in SARS. And so we got the first study that really captured everybody's attention. And this was in the New England Journal of Medicine, not my favorite journal. And this, uh, this study was published April, 2020. And what I noticed, and many other people noticed, is that it was relatively small in the number of patients included, but it was relatively large in the number of authors included. In fact, there were more authors on this study than there were patients included in the study. The Achilles heel with this one is they had no comparison group. They didn't compare it to anything. They didn't have a cohort that they propensed score match and said, how about usual care? How did they do compared to this? They just looked at 53 patients. They gave them this drug and they said, how do they do? And we know that the real question is, is that better, worse, or the same as usual care? 
because maybe this is just the natural history of the disease and the drug didn't have any impact. This type of study design can't tell us that. Now, there was heavy pharma involvement, and I'd like to be specific about the heavy pharma involved, so I will quote the manuscript. The paper said, quote, the program was designed and conducted by the sponsor. That's Gilead, the makers of this drug, in accordance with the uh, protocol. Now, the sponsor collected the data, monitored the con conduct of the program, and performed the statistical analysis. And then the initial draft of the manuscript was prepared by a writer employed by Gilead Science. Wow, that's what I mean by heavy pharma involvement. You can see how there might be a reason to suspect or be skeptical that there's a conflict of interest there. And if you wanna see a good review on it, Dr. Farkas has a great review on this in his uh, Palmcrit uh, uh, blog. Then the next study that came out that got everybody's interest just happened on April 29th, just about a week ago. And this was in the Lancet and this was by Wang et al. And this was a randomized control trial. So we like those words, randomized, double blind, <gasps> placebo controlled. <sighs> Love that. Okay. So this was multi-center in 10 hospitals in China and their primary outcome was time to clinical improvement up to 28 days. And what they found was Remdesivir was not associated with a statistically clinical benefit. In other words, there wasn't a patient-oriented outcome, a poo. Now, on the same day, Dr. Fauci gave a press release. And this press release or this press conference was from the Oval Office. And he talked about the data behind a randomized control trial that was placebo-controlled, multi-centered, I don't know about the blinding. We haven't seen the manuscript and came out and said in this study with over a thousand patients that it had a benefit and the benefit, the significant positive effect was a decreased recovery time from 15 days down to 11 days, which, you know, can be really important, especially if you're looking at your bed utilizations, your vents, your PPE, all of this stuff could be really, really important. Um, the only problem with this is we don't have the actual published result. And yet Dr. Fauci did say that this will become the standard of care. And I have a lot of respect for Dr. Fauci. Uh, he's done phenomenal things over the years. But at one point he did make a statement where he said, this one's for all the scientists out there. And ooh, ooh, I was like, oh, he's talking to me. Dr. Fauci's talking to me. I'm the nerd listening. And he goes, and then the p-value. And I went, oh, he talked about a p-value. Uh. Anyways, and so I have a little um, <clears throat> little graphic for the p-value because p-values don't tell us whether so the hypothesis are, is true or not. What it tells us is, did we falsely reject the null hypothesis and make a type one error? And so this was very concerning. And the, the final thing is, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can see that they changed their primary outcome about two weeks prior to the press release. That's That can be okay. It's just, it'd be great to have an explanation and it would be even better to actually have the paper. And so when we put our skeptical eye on this, we cannot recommend remdesivir based on the current available evidence. I practice medicine based on published literature, which informs my care, but not on unpublished data discussed at a press release. Patients deserve the best care based on the best evidence. And the best evidence at this point in time is remdesivir has not demonstrated a statistical mortality benefit. That's not been um, uh, uh, published. And it may, Sean, that was your cue, it may, Sean, that was your cue. It, Sean, or it may. may. Thank you. Oh my God. How many times did we rehearse this today? I a little lost a little Do you want to take the, you want to try it one more time? May sure. Not. Let's try it one more time. Okay. So um, it may or may not have a positive net patient oriented outcome. Well done. <laughs> there we go. We'll get this. <laughs> Uh, so the next topic we're going to cover is convalescent plasma. This is the one. Finally, something I can get excited about. I may get excited. <laughs> Ken? But may not. 
All right. Okay. So now the, the, the exciting part of, of this is that it is something that we're doing here in Canada and we're trying to um, run a trial. This trial is ongoing at this point uh, all across the country and patients who have had COVID and are now symptom free for a period of something like 28 days um, can donate their plasma for use in various hospitals that are participating. And these go from, from one end of Canada to the other, from Victoria all the way out to PEI. Um, and you can go online to see this and to, uh, to, to enroll patients who are interested in, in uh, uh, becoming a part of this, this trial. So it's got some, uh, some real science folks behind it. Um, Donald Arnold in Hamilton, Philip uh, uh, Be Begin or Beijing. Kristen, you can help me on that one. Okay. And Jeannie Callum and Sunnybrook, who is uh, fantastic. And these are very, very good research-driven folks who are going to give us some, some actual answers on this. Um, it is also going across to the United States, to New York. And um, we're planning sites, and uh, they're going to be activating in a stepwise manner. And the sites will be updated on uh, clinicaltrials.gov. So... That's all I have for convalescent planning. It's actually going to happen. We're going to get some real science behind it. And we hopefully will have some answers as to whether or not having someone else's antibodies to fight your COVID may actually make a difference. At this point, it may or may not <laughs> have any effect. And uh, the fifth and final thing we wanted to include was the uh, vaccine development. And this is my position on vaccines. Um, much work is being done on getting a COVID vaccine, but it's at least months, if not years away. And there's some unanswered questions even after that, like how effective will it be in, in uh, providing immunity or protection? And how long will it last? We don't know. I mean, some of our immunizations last decades, like tetanus shots, but other uh, immunizations that we get, like the flu shot, only last for one season. So there's some unanswered questions, even once we do get a vaccine. But that's all I'm really going to say about vaccines. But what about the effect with uh, different uh, internet towers and Wi-Fi signals, et cetera? Will people be able to track me? I do not know about the 5G and having a certain app on your phone, but um, I'll, I'm happy to track you because you're all over the province, you know, with your orange thing. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is um, uh, some other times of pandemics. So in, in September of 1918, in the middle of the worst pandemic in modern history, an article in the New York Times quoted Dr. Uh, Rupert Blue, the general surgeon of the U.S. Public Health Service, and he said that um, doctors in many countries will, were treating their influenza pa patients with digitalis and the anti-malarial drug quinine. There was no evidence that the two drugs were any more effective than the folk remedies being used by patients, which at that time included cinnamon, goose grease poultices, and salt stuffed up the nose. But doctors at that time were desperate and willing to try just about anything. So they'd eventually abandoned quinine and digitalis as treatments for the flu when studies showed that they were not only ineffective, but caused serious and sometimes deadly side effects. Does that sound familiar at all? Yeah, no, I'm so glad you included that. And this, that was a, um, a paper, that's a direct quote from uh, Jeannie Lenzner's at uh, Dr. Uh, Sharon Brownlee's paper that was uh, the pandemic science out of control. Going back a hundred years saying, a hundred years ago, Doctors were throwing spaghetti against the wall, hoping something that would work, you know, stuffing salt up the nose. Does that sound like zinc or vitamin C or using oregano or all these other things that have been tried for COVID-19? And then when studies are actually done, they're not only effective, but sometimes they're shown to increase harm. And I think that's a really important lesson to have. But Sean, I can take you back even farther. And this is where the special effects come in. doodle doo doodle doo Doodle -doo. So this time travel, let's go back to a randomized trial back in 1809. In 1809, the standard of care, and we've heard that term already tonight, the standard of care in 1809 was bloodletting. And if somebody presented with a fever, they would have their blood re um, uh, released by lancing them in the antecubital area. And you would bloodlet that patient. And Sean, now, just so people don't get the wrong idea, is that the standard of care for sepsis today to remove blood and volume? So, no. No. Okay. So, but that, the, all the bias 
was that was the standard of care. And a medical student, a Scottish medical student named Alexander Hamilton, not the one on Broadway, but Alexander Hamilton, a Scottish medical student, he was in the military. He was in this um, Peninsula Wars in Portugal in 1809. And he went, I'm not sure about this bloodletting thing. And so he did a randomized trial. It was a two to one trial. So two patients were randomized into no bloodletting for every one person into bloodletting. So it was a block randomization and they had very objective endpoints alive, dead. There was no princess bride, mostly dead. All right. So it was really, everybody could agree they were alive or dead. And they looked at patients getting bloodletting for camp fever. So they came in that they were sick, these soldiers, and then the patients that didn't get bloodlet. And in the bloodletting group, mortality was 29%. And in the no bloodletting group, the mortality was 3%. But just imagine before this study was done, the observational data would have been, oh, well, in my experience, bloodletting is better. And if the patient survived, it was due to the bloodletting. But if the patient died, the rationalizations and hand-waving would come up saying, well, clearly we didn't bleed them early enough. Clearly we didn't take enough volume out. Clearly we should have alternated from one side. Yeah, hand-waving. Hand-waving, their right hand dominant. We should have used that anti-cubital area. At the end of the day, they did a proper trial and the number needed to harm. And in this case, harm was death, was four. And this is a really important lesson. And that's because those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And we really, really need to remember this. We are in difficult times. There's a global pandemic going on, but good science takes time. And our patients deserve the best care based on the best evidence. We don't want history to repeat itself. We do want Sean to advance the slide, but we don't want history to repeat itself. And it's really, really important that we don't rush these things. Yes, we need to move with some speed, but there has to be a Goldilocks zone, not too fast and not too slow, just right. And because I made some comments about the New England Journal of Medicine not being my favorite journal, because I'm Canadian, that's how I say it, uh, but they published a really good prospective article or perspective article, sorry. And this article talked about the reminder to use reason because they said, quote, we are living through unprecedented times of biopsychosocial crisis and it's physicians. We must be the voice of reason and lead by example. We must reason critically and reflect on our own biases that may influence our thinking process. Critical appraise the evidence in deciding how to treat patients and use anecdotal observations only to generate hypotheses for trials that be can conducted with clinical equipoise. We must act swiftly, but carefully with caution and reason, end of quote. And I just love the last paragraph. That was so New England Journal. Thank you for publishing that. You get, you get credit. Um, I was really impressed with that. And I really think that that's something we need to think about when the next treatment option comes out for COVID, that we don't all rush to it and make the same mistakes over and over again. So that said, um, we can take a look and see if there are any questions about any uh, therapies. We didn't cover everything. We were prepared to cover all of the different uh, um various uh, things that people have been throwing at the wall and seeing if they stick. We have uh, we, we presented that in Grand Rounds uh, up in here in Kenora, Ken and I, uh, last week. Um, but there are, um, basically, there are no other good studies showing evidence for any other um, medication that has been looked at so far. Thank you, Sean. It's Kirsten. So indeed, you do, you do have some questions. And uh, just in the interest of time, we'll try and keep this uh, snappy and short. Um, so the first one is for Dr. Milne, and uh, it says, I saw today on CNN that cardiac arrest numbers are considerably down. Might we assume this is a result of people being afraid to present to the hospital because of COVID-19 fears or otherwise? There have been reports um, from multiple sources that individuals are hesitant to come in to the emergency department because of COVID-19. And so what used to bring people in, oh, I've got chest pain or I'm short of breath. 
they decide not to come in. And, and so we are seeing those numbers um, be down. It, certainly in my emergency department, I don't know about yours, Sean, have you seen the number of people with chest pain and then ruling in to be decreased? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know what? We have had a, um, a huge reduction in our numbers, 50% down. Uh, and and things like heart attacks, strokes, et cetera, are all coming in late. And so there is definitely some fear out there that people don't want to be coming to the emergency departments. And it behooves all of us. We've been trying to do this at Cape and trying to uh, do this across the country, I believe, encouraging people to seek uh, care in the emergency department if they need if they're having other symptoms, et cetera, because this is not the time to be staying away from the hospital because you're having chest pain that is unresolved. So yeah, I, I, totally I agree with this. Yeah, I had a conversation with Dr. Brian Goldman on his podcast, The Dose, recently. And, you know, the, the message, I mean, we did such a great job of flattening the curve and saying, stay home. And we needed that little follow-up. Unless, of course, you think you're having an emergency. And the patient decides, and it is safe. We are the light in the house of medicine that's always on for anyone, anytime, for anything. And I'd rather you come in and for me to say, yep, it turned out to be heartburn, than you stay home and die of a heart attack. So um, question two, uh, there's a question about zinc, and uh, you did not choose to cover it in tonight's talk. But uh, just wondering if there's any evidence uh, for this to limit viral invasion. Yeah, so uh, we uh, did do uh, a look-see at the issue of zinc, and there are some theoretical reasons uh, that zinc could work. Um, there's four studies listed in clinicaltrials.gov on zinc, and so there's some pathophysiology to explain why it may, Sean, or may not work, but it needs to be demonstrated to have a patient-oriented outcome. And when they looked at zinc for things like um, upper respiratory tract infections and stuff, there were some trouble with, I believe, the uh, nasal sprays causing some damage. So there, there is some potential harm, and any intervention has potential harm and potential benefit. But certainly, if there is a signal in there, um, I wouldn't, I'd be skeptical that it would be me a, a meaningful patient-oriented outcome. And uh, then there's also another one uh, asking for a comment on uh, Merrick's vitamin C protocol. He seems to be doing it, and unfortunately, colleagues colleague keep pointing to it, yet uh, there's nothing published on it other than testimonials. Yeah, I, and I, I think I'll, I'll just jump in here because I think that there's this is one of those amazing areas where there's, there's a lot of bench research looking at it. There's a lot of hypothesis generating work that says it makes sense that this is a precursor drug that's necessary in, uh, in making, you know, pressors and, and humans don't, they, we lack the ability to, to make vitamin C. They, unlike every other animal except for guinea pigs and humans, uh, we can't do this. But then when it comes time for the actual evidence, I would point you to Ken Milne, Skeptic Guide, of Emergency, Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine, for some of the follow-up from him for what he's put a couple of episodes out on this. Ken? Yeah, no, you know, vitamin C, just because it makes sense. I mean, we're, we're all really smart people that can rationalize anything. And 200 years ago, people were really smart and they rationalized things to say, hey, look at uh, it should work. Bloodletting should work. We should release the evil humor. The body's more complicated. It's not deficit of vitamin C, top of vitamin C, patient lives. The, the body's so much more complicated than that. And, you know, I, I hope it does work, but it needs to be demonstrated that it does work before I'll, um, you know, make it a routine part of my practice. And um, can do you know when the remdesivir study results are slated to be published? No, I haven't been able to uh, find that out. All you can do is go to clinicaltrials.gov and look up the study and you can compare, you know, their original outcomes and then their um, changed outcomes. One thing I didn't mention about it is, you know how many secondary outcomes they had pre-planned? It wasn't my favorite number. It wasn't, it wasn't my second favorite number, which is 11, but I do that unless I'm a fingered man. That was another princess bride thing. Um, but they had 30, I think, secondary outcomes. And that's, that's, I mean, I understand they're trying to capture as much data as possible, but it seems a bit like a fishing trip. And so, and Sean, for you, the use of steroids has been supported by good evidence in ARDS. If the Maduri trial and the DEXA ARDS trial showed evidence of benefit and no increased morbidity, why not use it? So the, the, here's the thing. I, it, in, in the setting of COVID with ARDS, 
there was, again, a weak recommendation against using it that was being thought about by the American Thoracic Society. And then there's Critical Care Society. Um, there isn't any convincing evidence within COVID ARDS that it's going to work. So if there's another compelling reason to use it, if you think the patient you know, is suffering from sepsis, isn't responding to pressors, they may be relatively um, steroid deficient. So it makes some empiric sense to, to try it, but there's no evidence. So and, it and, may... and what, what has steroids, you know, been thrown at, right? Like, uh, you know, it's the poster child for, look, it should have worked, you know, for spinal cord injuries. And then we threw it at them. We made it a standard of some kind and no, it didn't. And so I think we need to be very cautious because, you know, we can cause harm. And there's a great paper. One of my favorite papers from a couple of years ago is don't just do something stand there. Not <laughs> doing something is doing something. And what it might be doing is not harming our patients. And our patients deserve the best care based on the best evidence. And the time to adopt a claim is when you have sufficient evidence to accept the claim. And then uh, my last question, and I like this one a lot. <laughs> oh. was, it, was it about this? Uh, it's close. It's <laughs> why do we believe that why should we believe what we heard here tonight versus those two doctors from urgent care in California that caused a stir on social media? How can we really sort out what is misinformation? P.S. I believe you two and not those dodos. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Did question. You? But part of it is disclosure of conflicts that we did on our second and third slide that we don't make any money by by selling any of this stuff or by keeping our clinics open in the middle of COVID when they were shut down. Um, so there's that and a whole lot of pseudoscience that has been spurted out without actually, I don't think there was any claims that were, that were actually based on anything in the entire thing, the show. I watched the whole thing. Ken, do you have any comments on it? I, I won't comment on the other physicians in the United States. I try to stay out of that kind of stuff. It's about the science for me. Yeah, I'm a big nerd and I would encourage people not to believe me. I mean, that's the tagline to my whole knowledge translation project. Don't believe me. Be skeptical. Even if you heard it from me, I want, I want people to have critical appraisal skills so they can go, hmm, I'm not sure and question me and look it up because I can be wrong. I have been wrong and I will be wrong in the future. And so I want people not just to take it as eminence-based medicine. I want them to know how to actually critically appraise a claim. So don't believe me. Well, that's a nice way to end your talk. <laughs> don't believe anything I said. <laughs> so thank you so much to Drs. Mill and uh, Moore. And I think we'll move on uh, to our next part of the evening with uh, Dr. Hugh Borgenbach, who is uh, the director of the Schwartz Reisman Emergency Medicine Institute at Sinai Health System. He is an associate professor at the clinician and the clinician scientist in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Prior to clinical training, he completed a PhD in pharmacology at the University of Toronto and is the chair of Sinai Health Systems Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. Dr. Borgenbag practices emergency medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you, uh, Dr. Borgenbag. Hey, Kristen, thanks very much for that. And uh... I'm going to have a hard time uh, following up with the entertainment value of the previous speakers. Um, I was uh, asked to give a, a presentation on, I'm just going to start sharing my screen here. Um, make sure I get this right. Right. So I was asked to give a, a little presentation on critical uh, drug shortages related to COVID-19. I have a, a little bit of an eagle's eye view of this uh, by virtue of my role on the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. Uh, it's something that I've been aware of for uh, the last little while, and uh, I've, I've uh, recently become CAPES representative on the Health Canada Drug Shortages uh, Committee. Um, and so uh, we've been involved in uh, looking at all the different uh, issues that have arisen uh, during COVID. So, you know, at the beginning of all of this, we were all quite aware that <clears throat> there were problems with inadequate PPE. Everybody's been anxious. We don't have enough N95 masks. Do we have the right kinds of masks? Do we wear one pair of gloves, two pairs of gloves? Will it last? So there was a lot of uh, concern about that. And then there was also a lot of concern about the number of ICU beds we have and the number of ventilators. 
I know at my hospital, <clears throat> we've more than doubled the ICU capacity and, uh, and added a lot of additional uh, ventilatory capacity, anticipating that we were going to get inundated uh, with COVID patients. And thankfully, uh, that really hasn't come to pass. We haven't really exceeded the, the capacity of ICUs in the province of Ontario or in our hospital. Um, so that's been uh, very good. Uh, but the one thing that I don't think a lot of people were thinking about in all this conversation were the medications that we use for intubation, conscious sedation, the drugs that are used in the OR, and then the drugs that are used uh, to keep people intubated and sedated in the ICU. And, um, and we should be uh, aware of those things. So there has been increased demand for critical care beds, certainly, uh, in some areas and other jurisdictions. You know, thankfully, we didn't get what they got in, in New York or uh, in places in Europe and Great Britain, uh, we were never overwhelmed. Uh, uh, so, you know, we have had some resource challenges. There are lots of people in the province. So there's around 230 or 240 right now who are on ventilators in Ontario. One of the things that's interesting about COVID, however, is that um, these patients spend a lot longer on average in the ICU than a typical ICU stay. So, uh, I'm not an intensivist, I'm not going to pretend to be, but I believe the average length of stay in the ICU is around four or five days. Uh, the first person with COVID that got intubated in our emergency department got extubated last week. Uh, she'd been on the vent for 34 days. Uh, so uh, these people spend much longer on ventilators and therefore there's a much higher usage of sedatives um, uh, and paralytics uh, to manage them. Uh, in speaking with uh, some ICU colleagues uh, uh, recently, uh, they tell me that patients with COVID have a real air hunger uh, and they overbreathe on the ventilator and they're really a challenge. They really have to use um, a lot of sedatives. Uh, and so uh, they've been going through a lot. The other challenge we have, of course, is this isn't a local problem just to Ontario or Canada. Uh, this is a worldwide problem with a global increase in demand in many places uh, much more than ours. Uh, on top of that, there's reduced manufacturing capacity. Many of these drugs are made in China and made in India, and those countries, of course, have been heavily impacted by COVID themselves. So they've had uh, challenges uh, maintaining production uh, over this time. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a, a, a little brief sort of insight into the things that I've been learning about drug shortages in Canada recently, and it, I think it's helpful to understand uh, how the process works. So Health Canada has a multi-stakeholder steering committee on drug shortages, and uh, it addresses drug shortages in a collaborative way. So there on this committee, there are clinicians, there are members uh, of people from government, there's uh, or Health Canada. There's manufacturers and distributors of uh, all of the medications that we're talking about. Uh, so there's broad representation from every province and territory across the country. Um, the, the goal of the process is early notification of drug shortages uh, to help suppliers and healthcare systems respond and perform timely mitigation measures where possible uh, to try and uh, reduce the impact that drug shortages might have. So there is a protocol um, and uh, it sets out a tiered process for notification and communication of expectations. Again, the notification portion, the, the goal of it is to be proactive. So manufacturers and importers must post drug shortage information. Uh, there's, a, there's a website, www.drugshortagescanada.ca. Uh, uh, the regulations mandate that they must post notification of all shortages and discontinuations of drugs no less than six months in advance if they're aware of them coming or otherwise within five days of becoming aware of a real or anticipated occurrence. So uh, again, the goal is to try and give people lots of lead time to try and plan around that. Now, unfortunately, other, uh, often that isn't the case. This was one of those cases where there was no six months of planning. Um, uh, and then status must be updated uh, every two days uh, after becoming aware of a significant change. So it's, a, it's an accounting system that's kept uh, uh, up to date in a, in a pretty timely fashion. Uh, on the communication side, there's a sharing of information among critical st uh, stakeholders. Uh, all parties should adopt a proactive and precautionary approach. It's much like preparing for COVID in general. 
trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do with all the ICU patients? What are we going to do about ventilators? We need to think about what are we going to do about managing potential drug shortages before they happen so that there's a clear plan uh, and we're not caught uh, wondering uh, what to do. And of course, the goal, as I said, is to help all aspects of the system respond appropriately. So there's three different tiers uh, uh, according to uh, these regulations. A tier one shortage is an anticipated but not actual drug shortage. That's where the manufacturers post information publicly uh, and everybody discusses it and, uh, and then people uh, stay aware of it and try and figure out what they're gonna be able to do about it. That's what happens, for example, when a company stops manufacturing a drug. You've re probably recently heard there's a recent uh, discontinuation of Coumadin from one of the big pharma, uh, big pharma companies. So everybody has advanced warning about that and everybody knows where the other supplier is and where they can get it. A tier two drug shortage is an actual drug shortage. Uh, and that's where there's ongoing communication of detailed information regarding supply shortage, uh, including drug allocation levels. So that was a word that I learned uh, a month or two ago. Uh, all the medications that we're currently using to manage critically ill COVID patients are on allocation. The analogy is like trying to buy toilet paper at Costco. You, know, you can't just show up uh, with a big truck and buy all of it. You, you know, you're only allowed to get uh, so much. So what happens typically is hospitals are allocated an amount of the drug based on their uh, historical usage or, or a percentage of that. So there are drug drugs right now, for example, that are around 75%, some pressers around 75% uh, allocation, um, and there's just not enough to go around. Uh, and then uh, you know, the process is to notify Health Canada in the, in the event that it becomes uh, a tier three shortage. And a tier three shortage is an actual drug shortage with no available therapeutic alternative marketed in Canada. And the time frame for action on a, tight, on a tier three shortage is immediate. The tier three classification is important because it allows uh, the federal government to start sourcing Medicaid, try and source medications from markets that are not licensed in Canada. So you'll, you'll probably hear in the next uh, couple of days, if you haven't already, propofol has been in short supply. Uh, it's a tier three drug. Uh, there is now a new market that's been found, but it's not in a, it's not in a formulation uh, or a concentration that's been previously available uh, in Canada. So that's the kind of thing that people need to be aware of because when you start pro programming your pumps for infusion, if you've got two milligrams uh, uh, instead of one milligram uh, per mil, uh, it, it makes, or 20 milligrams per mil instead of 10 milligrams per mil, which is, uh, uh, which is what it is, uh, there's going to make a big uh, difference. So the tier three thing is very uh, important for the government to move forward. And that's, that's the role that the clinical people uh, have to play in this entire process where we give a, provide a context uh, to the members of this committee about whether this is really something that there is not an alternative about. So here is a, a current list of the tier three drugs uh, as posted uh, today by Health Canada. And you can see that uh, all the paralytics, all the sedatives, uh, many antibiotics, um, uh, steroids. Uh, I heard from Sean that uh, he's almost out of um, salbutamol uh, up where he is. There's 20 inhalers left in the hospital. Uh, that's not uh, just his hospital. There's a shortage of all of these medications. Uh, and this is, um, is a potential problem if, if, um, if these shortages get to be uh, worse or if there's a much higher demand uh, for these drugs. So the idea that we've started at our hospital, and I think is the interesting part of all of this, is we've tried to uh, come up with a coordinated stewardship response uh, at our hospital. And we've been having some conversations between emergency medicine, ICU, anesthesia, and believe it or not, palliative care is another place where a lot of these drugs and, and medically assisted um, aid in, are uh, uh, made. A medically assisted death, um, all these same medications uh, get used in very large doses. So some general suggestions that, uh, that we've come up with at our PT committee that are discussed and uh, trying to be implemented through the hospital are try oral over parenteral where possible, 
oral medications, it turns out, are not in short supply. If you have an opportunity to give somebody an oral analgesic as opposed to an intravenous one, uh, certainly that's worth trying. We recommend that people avoid pre-drawing medications. That's a common practice in lots of instances. For example, getting ready to intubate somebody in the eMERGE or in the ICU. People tend to have extra stuff drawn up. So try to avoid that if it's at all possible. We're recommending and we're trying to stock, at least in the eMERGE, small formats. So one mil, for example, over five mil uh, supplies so that there's less wastage. Um, and, you know, we're constantly checking uh, with pharmacy in the eMERGE anyway about a shifting supply of one format over another. So, you know, you may want the one mil ones and they may be out of sock and you may be stuck with the five mil ones. So you need to come up with a plan around that. The other thing that's been kind of interesting is that some senior staff, and I would probably count myself among that group, uh, recall days of using other therapies, uh, which may be as good. Uh, yeah, I've been teaching some younger colleagues how to do hematoma blocks recently. Uh, we're using Chinese finger traps to reduce colleagues' fractures. Uh, people are using regional uh, uh, nerve blocks and ultrasound-guided nerve blocks uh, where possible. I've been, that's not a good old days thing, that's a new thing, but it works uh, very well. I've been actually reducing dislocated shoulders quite a bit, and this isn't just a COVID thing, but uh, recently, uh, without any sedation at all. Uh, and it's surprising the number of times it goes back in quite easily and patients are very happy um, with that. In terms of the sedatives, uh, in the operating room, in our operating room, there are some anesthetists who are using total intravenous anesthesia. Uh, so that's been stopped. Uh, the chief of anesthesia has just forbidden that practice uh, altogether. So everybody now is getting a gas anesthetic. Um, they don't pre-draw drugs, as I mentioned. Um, and there's been no issue with supply of anesthetic gases. So that's one good thing uh, about all of this. In the ICU, they've been scrambling. They've been trying to minimize the use of continuous infusions. If at all possible, uh, try an oral agent or an option if it's possible or intermittent boluses for those needing light sedation. Um, people have been using a uh, train of four nerve stimulators to make sure that they are giving adequate supplies of paralytics, but, but not too much. Um, some places have been using alternatives. Dexamethamidine is an alternative uh, sedative, but it's very costly. Um, uh, you could even use phenobarb PO or IV or benzos as available in our ICU. They've been forced to go back to using midazolam, uh, which they haven't been doing for a long time. And they're learning about trying to manage those patients. They don't behave exactly the same way. They, they seem to spend a long time waking up. So there, there are some consequences to not having uh, enough of some drugs. I mentioned uh, oral administration. Some places in desperation I've heard of have been using fentanyl patches. Uh, uh, I'm aware of protocols involving low-dose ketamine and lidocaine, uh, lidocaine infusions to reduce uh, opioid demand. I'm not sure that it necessarily uh, solves the problem because ketamine is also a tier three drug that's currently on allocation. And uh, I mentioned nerve blocks and regional anesthetics um, where possible. I think I've already uh, talked about this. Uh, Health Canada has made a, an exception for pancuronium and vecuronium is the one notable thing, which has not been on the market in Canada for some time. Uh, so that's gonna have some impact on, on how people are paralyzing uh, patients uh, and will be unfamiliar with. Another uh, terrible problem has been that there's been a shortage of pressors, particularly levofed. So norepinephrine has been in short supply. Epinephrine has been uh, uh, apparently okay. Uh, but we haven't actually heard of anybody running out of uh, pressors. But, you know, and it's hard to imagine a conservation uh, measure where possible uh, in this instance uh, with a hypotensive patient. So I'd say in summary that there's some concern for widespread drug shortages. It's real in most provinces and territories in Canada, although a few places, I think only a few places have actually run out. Most people are trying to manage their inventories uh, very carefully. There is a global ongoing worldwide demand uh, for all of these medications uh, and, um, and you know, impacts on manufacturing have meant that there's no simple solution to provide these medications. I think that from the ED point of view, the first step is just to be aware that there are these shortages and for all of us to try and make serious attempts to avoid waste and try and uh, conserve medications um, wherever possible. 
I'd be very happy to uh, answer any questions if any anybody would like to send me an email. Uh, I promise I'll do my best to uh, to get back to you. Uh, if you have some questions, I'm gonna, uh, there's lots of things I don't know the answer to, but if you have some questions, I'd be very happy to uh, try and uh, find out. Thank you uh, so much, Bug. Um, I don't have a lot of questions right now from the chat. I mean, your your presentation was very comprehensive. It's, uh, in fact, very concerning. And I'm just uh, curious, you know, as we move forward and we have uh, more and more, you know, um, of these economies going back into to practice, kids going back to school and everything, and we're going to see potentially a new surge of patients in the EDs uh, with the regular stuff as well as COVID. Um, how will we manage the increased demand for drugs? And what is um, Health Canada doing to meet that um, issue, that the crisis at hand? So uh, Health Canada is doing everything they can to source these medications from other uh, locations. Um, as I said, it's pretty hard when they're in short supply everywhere and many places are affected uh, as badly or worse. Uh, the other concern I have, and you know, uh, I understand that people need to get going with uh, so uh, the other concern I have in addition to a second wave uh, is that, you know, I understand people need to get going with elective procedures and elective surgeries. You hear about all these places opening back up. They all use the same drugs. Uh, and I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure, um, where we're going to find all of these things. Are, are, are they using generics? Sorry, if, uh, my naivete, but we're, we're using whatever, whatever we can get. Uh, okay. Many of these drugs are generic. Uh, they come from different, there's multiple suppliers for a lot of them. Uh, but genetic or name, uh, generic or name brand, uh, the, the shortages of these medications are real. Uh, they are Canada wide. And, um, and I think it's, well, it's going to be very interesting is, is what it's going to be, I'd say, over the next six months as we see what happens going forward. And last question just for me, is uh, Health Canada, are we doing, you know, is there a position statement or is there some general uh, recommendations being distributed uh, provincially about this and, and what we need to be doing in terms of making these changes? So I don't know that, uh, I'm not sure that there's a body. I mean, there's all the, the, um, the professional organizations. So uh, the critical care people are all aware of this. Uh, there was a position statement that came out, a position statement, but a, bu a bulletin that came out uh, from Cape uh, a week or two ago uh, regarding this topic. Uh, and we managed to, you know, it was in the news a little bit. Uh, Al Drummond was uh, interviewed uh, on TV and, uh, and was making the case that there is a real shortage. Um, beyond that, I'm, I'm not really sure what else uh, we can do except for all of us. Uh, try and uh, yeah. do what we can. I think it's easy to minimize and say, well, you know, I just, I only do a couple of conscious sedations. We only do this many or whatever. Yeah. Every little bit counts. You know, right. I've heard that I've heard of uh, in our ICU, there were individual COVID patients that were, uh, they were using 50 uh, uh, ampules of rocuronium a day uh, on those patients. Um, it's, it's a lot of drug. Uh, to manage that air hunger that they have. And I just have, I'm sorry, I have one question actually that's just come in. And uh, it's from a physician who practices in the UK and, and, and uh, their capacity was evidently overstretched. And so that they had to use um, operating room and anesthetics machines. I guess they're, they're talking about um, uh, sevoflurane. Um, you know, these machines are not made for prolonged ventilation and there are issues with uh, filter blockage and water accumulation and CO2 removal. So is there a plan for substituting these in? And um, would you be putting people on inhalation aesthetics, anesthetics like sevoflurane? Well, I think we've got 16 or 18 of those machines that, you know, the ORs were closed down, were uh, available and were going to be pressed into use if there was no other option. You can't, they're not like real ventilators uh, for many reasons, apparently. Uh, but um, uh uh, we were going to use them if, if we needed them, if there was no other option. I'll tell you, interestingly, I do know somebody uh, in, the, uh, in the medical device business who tells me, he works for General uh, Electric, and he tells me that many places are canceling their orders for ventilators because they didn't get uh, the big surge uh, that they were anticipating. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, their supply is being redirected to areas where uh, there's most need. Uh, but um, But I think... I, I do think that people, I, I just don't know if it's uh, accurate or not. I'm not sure that, that we're going to really get lucky uh, 
uh, with COVID. I, I, I'm not sure about the second wave yet. Jeez. Well, thank you. I think it was very uh, interesting and timely discussion and certainly appreciate you sharing your contact information for people who uh, would like to, uh, if they have any other questions or would like to get in touch with you. Um, I'd be delighted to speak with them. Thank you, uh, you a pleasure. Thank you. All right, and so for the last part of this evening, uh, we have um, Dr. Trevor Jane and uh, Dr. Roderick Lim talking about wellness, which is a very important part of this whole marathon and uh, why this uh, section was uh, titled as such. And so Dr. Trevor Jane is an emergency physician and he's in Charlottetown, uh, Prince Edward Island. He is the program director for the Bachelor of Science and Paramedicine program at both University of PEI, as well as the medical director of paramedicine at Holland College. He has a master's of science in disaster medicine and is completing his PhD in the same area with a focus on UAV technology in the MCI environment. He's a member of the Canadian Armed Forces with multiple deployments in both humanitarian and combat environments. And uh, he showed us a picture of himself in front of his M16 uh, this evening. And so that was pretty impressive. That was behind the scenes before we got on our call with the rest of you. And Dr. Roderick Lim is the medical director and section chief of the Pediatric Emergency Department at the Children's Hospital in London, Ontario. He is the current chairperson for the Wellness Committee of CAPE. And his main energy is directed towards advocating for the well-being of emergency physicians and worrying endlessly about his three children and very large dog. And so before we get on to these two, um, Docs That Rock wanted to pass along a message. Um, and uh, I think we have a little clip from them. So uh, Jeff, do you want to run that? Oh, hi. I'm Pete from Docs That Rock. Look what our band has cooking for you. Stay tuned. Hi there, uh, uh, Dr. Lynn. Thank you uh, so much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you. Yeah, your, your, your work in uh, wellness and advocacy uh, uh, should be commended. Um, Rod, one of the, the things that's uh, come to light within wellness, you know, this recent high profile death of Dr. Lorna Breen, you know, an emergency physician from New York City, you know, it's really brought a lot of heat and lights on physician health and wellness and in particular mental health. And, and, and sometimes I, I, I struggle, you know, with the, with the definitions. And I'm, I'm wondering, can, can you just clarify for us, like, what, how would you define wellness versus burnout? Like, can you kind of clarify that for the members? Yeah, thank you for that. And I know a lot of our thoughts are obviously with the family of uh, Dr. Breen, uh, such a tragic loss. Um, uh, to answer your question, it's a good question. Um, uh, uh, I think the simplistic answer is probably the wrong answer, which is, uh, wellness and burnout are not necessarily opposites of each other. Just like uh, being healthy and having a disease are not necessarily the opposites. You could not have a disease and be very unhealthy. Um, so uh, I think the other important distinction really is that burnout, uh, and this was uh, a changing in the definition uh, by the World Health Organization, and it's, I think it's a super important distinction in our profession, uh, is burnout is an occupational hazard. Uh, it is, it is uh, and certainly in our environment, you can take the most well and resilient people and you put them in a very unhealthy work environment and the resulting occupational stress is burnout. And, and burnout really is that chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed and it, it tends to affect us in multiple realms. In physicians, mostly around the depersonalization of the people that we, that we treat, starting to not think of them as, as humans and as, as people worthy of, of our normal uh, you know, emotional giving that we would normally do, uh, and also the, the the feeling of emotional exhaustion, uh, where we have a hard time motivating ourselves to 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 do our work, um, and affecting multiple realms within our life. Uh, the third realm that's often talked about in burnout is emotional, uh, sorry, is personal accomplishment, and in physicians that tends to be not as correlated with uh, with burnout. So burnout, to answer your question, occupational stress, uh, definitely uh, not synonymous with depression. It really is its own entity that's related to unhealthy workplaces. Uh, and wellness really is, is, and hopefully we all can thrive in multiple areas of our lives that are important, whether it's financial health or medical health or uh, family health, uh, uh, et cetera. I, I liked how you comment there about kind of occupational stress and, and burnout. And then you, you did mention depression. And, and I'm, I, I'm just wondering, is there... Is there a feeling out there about, about how many or, or with people who are burnt out, who, who are depressed, and you, you said they don't have to be the same, but can you expand on that a little bit? Do you, do you feel that yeah. there's both are related or intertwined a bit more than? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think they're 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 definitely intertwined. Um, we did a recent survey across Canada looking at emergency physician health, uh, and if you scored poorly in the depression index, your chances of being burned out were like almost twenty times higher. Uh, wow. So there's definitely a, an interlinking, but they're definitely not synonymous. Uh, it would be a big mistake to say you're burned out, so therefore, you know, that's that's synonymous with a, a DSM linked uh, medical diagnosis, right. um, but certainly intertwined. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Rod, you and I have been working together for, for a couple of weeks, and I, I don't know about you, but I had this really sense of like one team, of a feeling of a collective or um, a collective team of all the emergency physicians in Canada that, are, you know, kind of got out of the gate hard and fast in March. And, uh, you, you know, we, we, we talk about this presentism versus a- absenteeism. Like, we, you know, we generally work when we're unwell, we work when we're overtired, other jobs don't. And do you feel that that feeling could be changing? Like, I, I, I don't know, like the, the snapshot, do you have that social feeling that, you know, in the beginning, we're all in it, we're in the trenches, we're, but now we're getting tired. And I don't know if you could comment on that, if now people are feeling more isolated or not, or, yeah. or what's your feeling? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really good point. Um, I think, you know, uh, as hard as phase one was, because there was so much that was uncertain and we didn't really know uh, the effects on ourselves or on our families, on, on, on everything that we cared about. Um, but there was this amazing sense of unity and purpose um, that, uh, the, and community support. I mean, there was an incredible amount of community support. Um, and I think that that was very uplifting. But I think, you know, in some of the ways as that's calming down, a lot of our, our pre-health yeah. and pre-relationships are starting to come through and we're seeing, um, we're seeing it politically, we're seeing it within our hospital or between do- different doctor groups. There's a lot more non-unity that's starting to emerge. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot to be said about, you know, the culture of your group before this happened. And if it was a great place to work, uh, I bet you that it was probably a reasonable place to be a part of phase one uh, of and I think if you were in a group that maybe didn't have the best culture, didn't look after each other's, um, I would hazard a guess that that was a difficult place to, to necessarily be part of a group of. Um, and I think you're seeing with government relations, I think, you know, the, a lot of the discord that was occurring, uh, like provinces like Alberta or other um, uh, provinces where there's a lot of um, a hurt and animosity, I think you're seeing that coming through uh, as well. Uh, and we're, we are not healthy before this. Like we know that our burnout rate, uh, so you remember the CMA study, they showed one in three doctors were burnt out and evidence across North America is that emergency visions are one of the worst. And, and some of the recent uh, studies that we've done, and we're almost at over three quarters of our physicians prior to COVID-19 met the definition of burnout. So we, are, we already started off unhealthy. Uh, and now you're right. I think we're starting to see a little more of that fragmentation. Yeah, I, I enjoy talking to you about wellness in the past and in, 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 in your expertise. And, and when you say that, like before the pandemic, there was a large percentage of us. And, and then we kind of dovetailed on the fact that phase one, we're in it together. You know, the public was behind you. You know, there was grades and thank yous and, and you know, first responder vehicles. That's kind of simmering down. Some tribalism is starting to to appear. Um, do, you, do you think overall, like as a collective it, it, I'm asking you, and I apologize to, to look at a crystal bar, like our health wise post pandemic, like, you know, look in 12 months, 18 months, is that too, too far ahead to look at? Is it hard to predict now based on what's going on? Or what, what, what do you think of that? Like if you were telling me as a colleague, what Trevor, is this what you should expect for the next year? Health-wise? There's a lot of very good talk right now of the fact that we really need to, to open up that discussion. We know from the limited experience from even from SARS, which was a pretty small time frame. Uh, and only certain parts of the, of, the, of the countries was affected. We know data from that from those studies showed a significant increase uh, in post-traumatic stress disorder, in, in anxiety, uh, in, in depression, uh, to, to a pretty consistent degree across the countries that it was studied in. Uh, and that was in a pr- pretty short period of time. In, in this case, you know, there isn't a, a doctor in, in Canada, or there isn't a person in, in the world really has not been affected in some way by uh, by COVID-19 dramatically, and then over a very sustained period of time. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of our gaps have shown up with the virus in terms of our vulnerable populations and protecting and, and things like that. And I think a lot of our gaps in terms of mental health supports and the cohesive and comprehensiveness of those supports are going to show through as well. And I think it's so important that we start the conversation now 
while people are listening, uh, because we anticipate that uh, we're going to need uh, significant mental health support for the community and ourselves. And, and, and speaking of those, have you heard some initiatives or some wellness initiatives that have you heard about with regards to physicians? Have you heard of some unique things that are occurring? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, uh, I, I've seen some pretty innovative programs that have been within well, within uh, certain uh, emergency groups. Uh, and I think that the common theme amongst it is is uh, communication and connectedness. Uh, so whether it's a, um, a check in uh, with us, uh, 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 I've seen monitor check ins where people assign themselves to groups of three or four, and they will regularly check in with themselves. Uh, over the course of uh, over the course of of the of, of weeks, and that just makes sure that no one's left behind. Uh, there are, you know, it's so important to watch for people that have a change in behavior or maybe uh, much quieter than they usually are. Uh, they're very isolated right now. We all are, all are. Uh, and so it's super important to put in structures where you know we're we're trying to connect with each with each other. There are certain places that have started peer support programs. Uh, where they have people that, that have put themselves on a list and you can call them and uh, have a conversation with a peer who understands kind of your work environment. Um, and I know there's just a, a tremendous outpouring of support from the community. Um, as people know, the Canadian Mental Health uh, Association um, has offered free counseling for frontline workers uh, uh, across the board and that continues to this day. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of myriad, but I think it takes a lot of active engagement to find the people that are struggling because uh, you know they're probably struggling silently uh, and we know uh, before this happened four out of five of us are completely happy talking to a colleague who's having trouble but we know only one in five of us will actually engage someone who's having trouble so we're the worst when it comes to what's, our bias what's, what's the difference there rod so four, four to five happily talk one in five will engage like well, it, it's stigma it's stigma. At the end of the day, we're completely happy. It's like, oh, that's no problem that you have. You know, you, you need support. I'm happy to support you. But I will never admit that I might need support. Uh, and, you know, I don't know about you, especially with the amount of activity that we've had with COVID, which is not a, not a crazy amount compared to the New York or Italy. Um, you know, uh, the hero label doesn't help. And I don't, I don't feel like a hero. I don't, I don't know what people feel like in the audience. Um, but, you know, along that label, the heroes ask for help when, when they need it. So, you know, a part of it plays to that stereotype that we all try to strive to, which is to be strong and to be resilient and to be self-sufficient. Um, but that's going to hurt us in the end when we know that we are horrible at asking for help. Yeah. And, and, and just to dovetail on that, because what I'm hearing is kind of, you know, workforce health, you know, physician health, you know, if, if you had a message to, you know, medical directors in each of the hospitals in Canada with, with the equivalent of their, you know, CEOs or, 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 or C, CEOs, we know, if, you know, if you, if you don't have um, a workforce, you don't have a capability, you can have the best hospital in the world, the best equipment or that or anything. Are there steps that they can do, Ron? Like, were there steps that you would say, you know, listen, you, this is what you need to do to maintain your capability, a, a happy, healthy workforce to, to respond? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's, a, it's an easy, easy answer, but it's probably the hardest to implement. And I think if, if I could put it down to it is, is care deeply about your physicians. And I think I say that a little bit sarcastically is the fact that you know, when push comes to shove, if you actually ask, are you covered as an employee of the physician uh, of the hospital, the answer is often no. Um, so, you know, it, it comes down to paying attention. Um, you know, there's a, a huge, I think, resonance of the idea of moral injury in, in emergency yeah. medicine. I think, you know, people got very upset, rightly so, when we talked about burnout and we, we kind of said, you need to do yoga, you need to do this kind of stuff. And we're saying it's the workplace. And before COVID hit, it was all about the fact that you won't let me do my job. There's right. a bedrock. block. Uh, right. I can't physically get the patients in. I'm giving horrible care. And this is actually taking a toll on, on my, my sense of purpose. And you need to fix this because it's actually making it's we're all suffering because of it. we're all burning out. And in some weird way during phase one, as hard as it was, in some ways, a lot of emerge docs were invigorated because the bed block was gone. Yeah. So I kind of like this. Right. And in some ways, you know, the administration needs to pay attention to these things because they matter. And, and where it's where that moral injury is coming now in this kind of phase two is, you know, where is the PPE? for me right now, or, you know, recognize that when I see a patient, it's very hard for me to, to think of the patient as someone I need to help, but at the same time, think it's a patient that can harm me by giving me COVID, 
or recognize that when there's a, when I have to tell a family member they can't come in and and learn what the discharge diagnosis and all the instructions, that also is a moral injury. So, you know, I ask administrations to pay attention and to actually, you know, listen to us in the front line and help us, you know, make the job um, plausible and possible uh, in a way that is healthy for us. Yeah, and you, and, and I, I like that example that you use with the the PPE, and I and, and I don't want to go down the PPE rabbit hole. We've had some really great town holes on the practical portions of PPE, which are free, and you know, encourage all everybody watching this to to check them out. Excellent speakers. I think there's a difference, like for me, of of being safe and feeling safe. Yeah. So you know, sometimes logically, you know, you know, when you go into a room, that sort of thing, and. and does that affect moral injury? Does that affect your, your perception of, of harm, you know, for, for wellness? If I feel safe versus, you know, being safe, if that makes sense. The, I think they're two things. They're two different things. Yeah, I, I absolutely do. And I think, you know, I think a lot of what I've seen in terms where people were really upset when it came to PPE is, you know, like, how can you ask me to do what you've told me forever is, is not good practice. And in a way that is like, you know, you're supposed to be, providing the things I need to be safe. And can I trust you to deliver? You know, you, you, you didn't tell me there was a problem. I asked you, nothing happened. And then three days later, you're saying, oh, by the way, we're now short of this. And you're like, whoa, whoa, I, I asked you that. And you said it was fine and now it's not fine. And, and you know, so it's kind of like, I, I can trust you have good intentions, but can I actually trust that you're gonna come through? Like, are you competent to actually come through and protect me and, and have me do my job. So, you know, putting your trust, you know, we used to, it used to be, you know, you don't, you never really thought you would show up at the hospital and not have what you need to stay safe. And that uncertainty, I think, and, and, you know, we've had that at every corner, there's been so much uncertainty that you don't even know what's going to happen. You know, the next time you come in to say, you know, am I actually going to be okay uh, today? And I, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a tremendous toll, um, you know, uh, in people that don't really want to, think about how they're feeling, right? I think a lot of us are pretty, we don't like to talk about our feelings. Uh, we mm -hmm. talk about a roller coaster. We're, we're on a roller coaster ride with people that hate amusement parks, right? We're on a marathon that people that, that we hate to yeah. run. Yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, it's a huge, huge uh, consideration. And I think, you know, just like we have to, uh, we have as a society have to re rethink about going to work sick. I mean, that just can't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we also in a society have to be in a place where if I feel like I, I'm not in a place that I can go to work because of my mental health. Um, I should not feel like that will be a barrier if I was to tell someone. So if I told someone right now, tomorrow, I can't come in because I'm not doing well mentally uh, in my mental health, you know, what are the barriers that are going to come up? And they're, they're huge. They're, there's a huge number, but we got to come around to that. Uh, and, and we got to build in that redundancy. We've got to build in support systems and, and, and hospitals have a huge role to play in this. Do you, do you, do, Rod, the, the, besides the hospital supports and you're talking about feeling safe and, and, and being safe, do you think there's a persona right now, like this warrior persona of being an eMERGE doc? So, you know, this is it, we're up to bat, the bases are loaded. And is there that maybe imposter syndrome almost that, man, I, 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 I go to work, I know, I know I can't predict what's gonna happen, but now with the pandemic, do you think more people are suffering and maybe not verbalizing or picking up a call or? Yeah, oh, I think so, but I think it's also, you know, talking about phase one ending, uh, a really interesting phenomenon happened in, in New York. Uh, and Wendy Dean spoke to, to Z Dog on a, a podcast about this, and it really struck a chord with me. Is that, you know, right before was, uh, things were happening, everyone was screaming, you know, give me PPE, everyone was freaking out. But when it actually happened, and when phase one happened, you heard nothing. None of us had the energy to, to advocate or to talk. We just tried to go to work, figure how things are, try to sleep do all those kind of things. And we never really had a chance to decompress at all. Maybe a little bit here and there, but I'm sure if we look carefully through the last few weeks, how many of us slept well, how many mm -hmm. of us, you know, uh, ate well, exercised, uh, felt, you know, to, that we could not think about COVID uh, for any period of time. Uh, right. Probably not very many of us. And I think when this phase slowed down, that's when I think uh, it has to rear its head, whether we want to be a warrior or not, it's going to come out in weird ways. It's going to come out with a sudden flash of emotion of like, well, why am I so angry right now over right. something that wouldn't have angered me? Right. Um, so, it, you know, it's such an interesting phenomenon, but I think, you know, if you follow the board, do you follow the, the people? A lot of people are really expressing that kind of anger and, and emotion right now. And, and it, it answers the question like, why Nile? Not, why not three weeks ago? 
we right. just didn't have energy. We didn't have the bandwidth to talk about it three weeks ago. Right. Right. And, and, and you, you know, you mentioned about our health, what the hospital can do, kind of our roller coaster to use your analogy. But, you know, you, I mean, you and I've had bad shifts when we've come home and we've kind of had to decompress in the garage or on the drive home or, you know, maybe just take a little bit more time to change to come home. You, you, you know, I, I you know, I, I call it the pressure chamber. You know, you need 30 minutes to get in. What about our families? What do you think, you know, the, the, the stress, the contagion of the stress or the occupational stress that we're undergoing with their families? Is there things that we should be made aware of or any advice you'd have for us that we should minimum our impact on our families, but at yeah. the same time using their supports? I don't, you know. Yeah, I know. I, 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 you know, I acknowledge, I think that's probably one of the hardest things about this personally for me has been that, you know, I can't, it's, it's affecting my family as well. And the decision to, uh, I think it was a great decision now, but the decision not to uh, leave the household was a yeah. very tough decision uh, to make. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, we have a lot, on, we have very limited bandwidth right now. And we also see, we could be seeing our kids struggling. We could see our, our family struggling. So, you know, I, 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 it's, it's a tough one. And I think, you know, when I say we're all in it together and we're stronger together, uh, you know, I mean it. Um, yeah. I think, you know, reaching out to a peer for support and, and hearing that they're struggling too, or, or what, you know, what they're thinking about really kind of normalizes it and, and makes us kind of come into a little bit of a better framework about our situation. Um, specifically, if you have children that may be suffering or whatnot, you know, if anything, there's too many references out there. Everyone has a, a page with references on it, but I know a lot of the, the uh, children's mental health uh, networks, like I know there's one in Ontario called the CMHO, they have wonderful web resources for families and for children. Uh, related to to coping uh, in the time of COVID, do you do you think, Rob? We kind of talked touched a bit about the imposter syndrome, and you know, we started at the top with our feelings out for uh, Doctor Doctor Breen's family. Do you, do you think this, in a way, sheds lights and gives us permission during the pandemic and post pandemic to be more human, like uh, viewed by you know what um, you, you know? I called my colleague and said, you know, I had to really bad shift or 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 it's okay my shift really sucked or this is why i'm angry do you do you think this is all in a way giving us permission so we talked about kind of imposter syndrome maybe not we had to be that warrior type for the first couple of weeks i you know um do you think this is this the you know this could be a benefit to us that this could give us permission to be human i i hope so um it's hard to get someone to like roller coasters and to like marathons. We're hard to change. I think yeah. most people would call emerge dogs not particularly uh, great at uh, at uh, self discovery and and uh, and change. But you know, one can only hope. And I think you know we're we're, we're logical, uh, and I think we see stories of that tragedy. We know the stats that we're not healthy, and we know that we don't seek help. And, and I think all of us can admit that that is a pretty bad recipe if left unattended uh, for, bad, for bad outcomes. Um, so I, I urge people to, to stretch and to, 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 to acknowledge whether they're okay or not okay and reach out to a colleague and make sure that they're okay uh, and, and you know, make sure that there's no one left behind uh, because I think that's super important. This is going to be a lot longer. There's going to be a lot of disappointments along the way um and i think you know you know uh, we all got to get out of this you know yeah. healthy and 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 on the other side uh so i hope so yeah i, I you know in the interest of time rod i just want to finish up uh, two things one is you know can you comment on where people can go for help and is there anything else that you'd like to share that uh, you know we maybe haven't got got into yeah thank you and you know i, I think i uh, one thing I would say, and, and, I, and I'm very passionate about this, is that if it was the one thing that we could ask the government to do is develop a comprehensive, mental, uh, comprehensive health support program for physicians, regardless of where you are or who you work for. Um, because what, to answer that question right now, it really depends on where you work, um, what hospital you're at, whether you have a, an appointment with the university, all those kind of things, and it shouldn't be that way. I think we deserve to have health benefits uh, and mental health supports, regardless of where we work. Um, and I, and I, I try to echo that message any chance I get uh, uh, to, to, to anyone that will listen. 
Um, in terms of uh, right now, uh, the probably the best place to, to look if you're not sure within your own hospital uh, is to, to look at your provincial uh, medical association. They will also often have uh, mental health supports and list of resources that are going to be pertinent uh, to you. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, you can call 24-7 the helpline from the Canadian Mental Health uh, uh, Association, and they are offering free uh, sessions of therapy if you're interested in that or, or if that's something that would benefit you for any frontline healthcare worker during this pandemic. And, and you could call for a friend too, right? Because some people, the people that need the help won't do it, but maybe if I notice somebody, I could call and, and, and make that maybe first step. Yeah, and that's excellent. I, and I think at the end of the day, we all have to be open to receive help and we all have to be looking for others that may need help more than ever. Uh, people can really hide right now. Uh, and we can be really distracted. So I think, you know, we need to put that mental bandwidth and look around and who who could who can be to reach out at this point. Okay. All right. Dr. Lim, I, I really want to appreciate the, the sacred work that you do for us, uh, for, for the membership and your advocacy role. And uh, I've learned a, a lot from you in, in the last number of weeks. So thank you and uh, keep up the fight and keep and keep uh, keep looking after us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Trevor. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, it's been a very interesting um, session, actually, uh, very informative and timely. And I actually have a few questions from um, our um, audience, if you don't mind. Um, one of them is interesting. It's a, it says, in an ICU setting, how can one deal with all the emotions and stress when you're caring for actually one of your colleagues? And should these colleagues be transferred to other ICU units to ease the stress of the team? Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh... Um, you know, that's an absolutely heartbreaking uh, situation. And we certainly have heard of that happening, uh, especially in places that are overwhelmed. Um, um, you know, it, it's an excellent question. I think, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to, to make an assessment as to our ability to take care of the patient in front of us. If we really feel that we, because of our emotional attachment or, or whatnot, uh, I think we need to be honest. Uh, and I'm sure there are other people within uh, within your work group that uh, may feel maybe more comfortable or could relieve us. And again, it goes to, uh, down to just being really honest with yourself and asking for help. Um, the transfer out question is a, is a tough one. And I think it really uh, comes down to also thinking, weighing about the, the effect on the family that already can't visit uh, and what, you know, what, what the, the downstream ramifications of that are. Um, but I can't say enough, you know, that's a great you know, example of, of the horrible situations that we're being put into right now and, and how we have to kind of juggle, you know, let's be honest, and what, what can I do? Uh, and what do I, what do I think, you know, and be admit that you can't. Uh, and so great question. And uh, do you think regular weekly PCR tests like COVID tests for the frontline staff would give them ease and confidence and improve their sense of wellness when going to work every day? Yeah. 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 So, so, you know, I, I mean, uh, I guess I want to acknowledge the emotion behind it. And I think that just speaks to the fact that, that, you know, we all are worried about getting sick and we're really worried about bringing it home to our loved ones and, uh, and exposing our colleagues and, and whatnot. Um, put, taking my wellness hat off for a second, we know the tests are not 100% accurate. Uh, and certainly in asymptomatic people, they're not 100% accurate as well. So um, as in some ways, it probably is not scientifically practical or or reassuring. Uh, but on the other side, I think the emotion of it really speaks to the, the dilemma that we face ourselves in of constantly worrying that we're infected and, and affecting our, our, uh, our, our loved ones. Sure, of course. And Trevor, so did you have anything to add to that? No, I, 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 I just couldn't imagine uh, uh, be, being in that um, uh, be, being in that space and, and to, to make those decisions with a with a colleague and uh, Raj has given us a lot to lot to think about um, mm -hmm. a lot to think about going forward on this marathon mm -hmm. okay and so then and the final question is that uh, we are having a real true n95 mask shortage in montreal and some models are fully out of stock and won't be replaced and um so any advice on how to deal with this situation both on an individual and departmental level yeah so uh very difficult situation um uh, I can't speak to the situation in Montreal, but certainly, you know, we've had analogous situations where uh, everyone was 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 uh, fitted to a certain type of mask, and that mask is not being released from England right now. Uh, it was the most comfortable one. It was the most commonly one used, and suddenly, you know, we're finding ourselves in a situation where uh, we have people that are failing the tests, uh, and uh, we have to make a decision of, of the redeploying them or not. 
we're coming with other strategies depending on our supplies. So it's a very real issue in a very lot of hospitals because again, uh, N95 is only good if it fits your face. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I feel for that. And I think, you know, if I could say one thing about, um, you know, successful uh, um, uh, leadership during a pandemic, and I think it comes down to honest communication. I think, you know, if, if you are honest with where you are, uh, it doesn't matter if you're wrong tomorrow. If you gave me the best information you had today, you, you kept me up to date. So I saw it coming. Uh, you, I understand your thought process and, and, you know, you're not worried about saying something because you're going to get sued by what you said. You just told me because it's the truth that goes a million miles toward faith in the people that are relying on you for their health. Nobody wants to hear a bureaucratic answer uh, and a surprise and a tough luck. Um, nobody wants to work in those kind of situations. So I, I, I you know, I, I, I would emphasize that, you know, nobody expects you to be able to read the future because none of us know what's going to happen in a month or a year. Nobody. Um, but what we do want is honesty, clear communication, uh, and empathy. Uh, and so I would really, I really, really hope that, that whoever that uh, posed that question or provided those things. Oh, that's a great way to end it. Um, so thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody, to all of our speakers. It was a, a really interesting session and very timely. And uh, I think, Rod, we might um, continue to have little uh, bits of wellness uh, spattered throughout our our future town halls. And so uh, we thank you and Trevor um, for all of all of this conversation and, and uh, look forward to more. And that uh, I hope everybody stays well and healthy. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us tonight to everybody out there. And uh, it's important what you're doing, so keep doing it. And uh, we're here for you and we'll look forward to having you tune in next week to the Cape COVID Town Hall. Good night. <laughs>